Hello, I'm Kemal Santa Maria, and welcome to Rewind. Ten years ago, here in Qatar, Al Jazeera English was launched. And over the next few months, to mark that important anniversary, we're going to be based here, Doha's equally iconic Museum of Islamic Art. The purpose of Rewind is simple, to give you another chance to see some of the most memorable documentaries we've made for you in the past decade. And we also want to update you on what's been happening since our cameras left. So to begin, today we rewind back to Afghanistan, early 2011. Although plans were even then being made to withdraw US forces, NATO's war against the Taliban was still in full swing. And every day it added to the number of combatants and civilians being wounded and killed. Few people understood what this meant better than the medevac personnel, the ones who were helicoptering out across the country to pick up casualties, often while under fire themselves. To find out what it was like on board one of those units, veteran freelance cameraman Vaughn Smith spent two weeks with the paramedics of the US Army's 214th Aviation Regiment. His footage was turned into an outstanding episode of our People and Power series. It revealed both the shocking reality of war and the remarkable even-handedness of those providing care. In a moment, we'll be speaking to Tyrone Jordan, who, as you're going to see, was one of the central characters of the story. But first, here is the film, Blood and Dust. And I should warn you that right from the start, some of the images are disturbing. He was going into uh, shock, hypovolemic shock, loss of blood. The container was uh, leaking out blood, so to speak, in simple terms. But we sealed the container back again with the tourniquets. Uh, he was a little confused. His uh, level of conscience was, was decreasing a little bit. He was still in that state of shock. What I mean by that is he was still surprised that he had gotten hit, but due to him being in uh, good shape, he was able to sustain his, his own respirations. His respirations was like uh, maybe 24. Uh, pulse was 120. So he was able to sustain life, and he will be fine because I checked on it long enough to get him back to the hospital, the Rule 3 over here in uh, the wire.
My name is Sergeant Jordan Tyrone. I'm a flight medic at uh, the 1st or the 214th Aviation Regiment out of Germany. We have a motto, striving to save lives, and every day we go out in the wire, we strive to save lives, because that's our mission here. We are out several times a day, uh, just answering the call, whatever it may be, from uh, picking up a guy that just been struck from an IED to the, uh, to the guy that has abdominal pain. That facility just can't facilitate uh, running the necessary exams. We need to move them to a higher echelon of care. So, you know, the full spectrum of injuries, uh, averaging you know anywhere from five to fifteen calls a day. So, uh, you can get pretty busy. It's very disorientating. You don't know where, where the casualty is. And you'll sort of land into a dust cloud and the dust starts to settle and you can then work out what's going on. The medic will have had a conversation sometimes about the nature of the casualty, um, but not always. And so what you'll have is this briefing in the dust where the soldiers will tell um, the medic, exactly what they've done. Have they applied morphine, how many tourniquets, um, and what else they may have done to try to stabilize the, um, the, the casualty. The medivac teams and, and people like Ty Tyrone um, are relatively unique in a combat or a fighting force because they're there to save lives, not to take them. And I remember the image uh, that is left with me of a pregnant Afghan woman um, looking across and seeing her mother, who was very much worse, uh, in a much worse state than she was, and seeing her trying to be saved. I found that very moving as well. A lot of the missions we do are local nationals. Uh, the three we did today were local national. Um, uh, probably or roughly about half, if I had to guess. We'll go in for anybody. We go in for locals, we go in for soldiers, we go in for coalition forces, we even go for enemy uh, uh, POW. Everybody was treated equally. There was no distinction in these crews and the medics like Tyrone in the effort they made to save any life, and that could be a Taliban life. Um, we would only know if a Taliban had come into the helicopter um, or an enemy insurgent uh, because a Marine uh, would, would accompany them. So, and they'd normally be handcuffed if there wasn't a good medical reason why that was inappropriate. And we had people who had been making bombs. There was one person who got blown up by the bomb they were making. Um, and we'd have, we'd have quite a few Taliban come into the helicopters. But, but Tyrone would apply the med medical um, uh, assistance to everybody universally. Um, and that was quite an impressive thing to see. The aim of this helicopter isn't to fix you, it's to keep you alive. And they do that by trying to keep everything working, by treating the body as a container, making sure it doesn't lose more liquids, and if it, if it has lost too much, trying to replace them quickly. Trying to reduce the shock, trying to address pain, and trying to uh, ensure that um, they contain the body so it can cope by staying alive long enough to get to the hospital where they can really start sorting you out. Um, and it's, it's remarkable what they can do. It's remarkable because if you get alive into that helicopter, um, the chances are uh, pretty close to certain, of course there's a small amount, but it's pretty close in the high 90% that you're going to live. over the history of the conflicts that, is, that the U.S. has been involved with over the years, uh, each war we've learned something new. But in, uh, in the past decade, uh, there's been several advances. First thing is stopping, stopping the bleeding. 
the use of tourniquets as kind of a primary use of stopping hemorrhage. Prior to this, it was uh, thought of usually only as a uh, last resort. Um, it's been saving a lot of lives. The other things are hemostatic agents, and what those are is just uh, different agents that we can use to form clots on the side of injury. So stopping the bleeding uh, is probably the most important one right now. Airway, uh, that's another thing that if we can manage the patient's airway, uh, they have an increased survival rate. So um, we're, doing, we're doing right by that. group we were with, there were actually six helicopters, and three of them were medical helicopters and had red crosses on. The other three, they're, they're called chase helicopters, and their job is to provide a sort of close protection. And they all have machine guns, and it, it, in the event of coming in to pick up a casualty from a hot landing zone where there's still a, a fight going on, they're, they're there to provide uh, covering fire. Steve, I got top three, safe on deck, uh, they want to go first. The guy's running towards us, he's in there, starting to swing. I do not want you to have the patient here through to the park to the west and climb. I'm having got three captains west and climb. We're 30 seconds. We're having 30 seconds. Just be advised, I got about one minute until. Oh, yeah. Yeah, about the, about the patients, uh, how it went, um, uh, are they going to be okay, the guys? Uh, the guys are going to be fine. Uh, there were two uh, POIs, point of injuries, in a hot landing zone for us. Uh, the first guy was 19 years old. He got shot in his right calf. Uh, they gave him 10 milligrams of morphine on the ground. The medics did an excellent job of stopping the bleeding. It wasn't a through and through. It was uh, uh, just an entry wound. He started to swell, have uh, discoloration. He started to lose feeling in his, uh, his right lower limb. Uh, the second patient, he got shot on the right side of his neck, just be maybe like an eighth of an inch before the juggler vein. Uh, and the ricochet came out through it top portion of the right scapula. He got lucky that it didn't uh, hit any major organs. His vitals is pretty normal. I got a PAP of 125 on him. Uh, his pulse was like at least 90. He had, they had given him 10 milligrams of morphine also. Very lucky, he was 22 years of age from Arizona. Uh, I kind of like to talk to my patients to keep them alert and oriented so they won't pass out, you know, keep them calm a little bit so it'll make uh, treating them a little easier. Uh, I found that uh, when you talk to the patients, they relax more. They're not as scared, not as frightened of, of, of dying because that's the first thing he asked me. Was he, was, was he going to uh, die? The, the guy that got shot in his neck, yeah. yes. And that's why I started talking to him. I, I saw the fear in his eyes, so it's very important to keep an open line of communication with your patient also. And that way, they don't feel like you're just there to treat them and just to do your job. It's more than a job. I mean, you have to care about your patients also. They're gonna be okay. They, they probably will go back to uh, Germany, long stool Germany, for rehabilitation. Will he lose a leg or will he be okay? No, no, he, he's going to be fine. Uh, I think we got him there in plenty of time. He was just starting to lose feeling in his uh, right leg uh, as we was orbiting around for for our guys to clear, clear out the hot LZ for us. In fact, you know, as you can witness yourself, it wasn't too clear. But we got shot at, yeah? Oh, yes, we was taking, we was taking a lot of shots. Yeah. A lot of shots. I thought the aircraft got hit in which we was fortunate that it didn't, you know, they had good suppressive fire, so. So good morning, you're happy with your work? Yes, I am happy with, with my work, and this is what we do every day, all day.
I think it's tremendously important. They have confidence knowing that if they get injured or if they get hurt, uh, we'll come and get them. And we do so in all environments, uh, day and night, under, under very illum uh, low illumination periods. That gives a soldier confidence that, that they can continue to fight and we'll be there for them. This is really interesting to me um, because the morale of the Americans and the British troops on the ground is significantly raised by the knowledge that the chance of them actually being killed by, by being hit by a bullet or, or bomb is quite low. It's an extraordinary achievement that people aren't dying in the numbers they would have without this medicine. But when the Americans or a country like Britain and the West um, fight wars, there's only a certain amount we're prepared, our public are prepared to lose in terms of human life. So what's happened is uh, modern medicine, uh, modern battlefield medicine, has become so advanced that it's able to maintain its morale at home because it keeps the numbers of killed and the statistics down in such a way that these wars become more sustainable. And it begs the question uh, that somehow are the rules of war, um, the Geneva Convention, um, are a little bit out of date because they were designed um, for a period of time where you know, a battle would be decided and then the problem would be looking after the wounded. Whereas now, uh, you can have a helicopter with a red cross, which would suggest that you shouldn't shoot at it. Um, but if that helicopter with the medicine inside it is a force multiplier, then does that not make it a valid target? Well, initially we had gotten called for a uh, elderly man that had been shot from his lower lumbar, protruding out of his stomach, which his intestines were. Uh, the patient was somewhat stable. Then we got rerouted to another tick, troops in contact, and uh, an ANA soldier had gotten shot. Like I said, it went through mid bicep on the lateral portion, right under the anterior portion of his right arm, right across through his heart. It shot right across his heart. And then came out on the other side. And uh, we tried to revive him. And uh, we got a pulse, got his heart rate back up. But because of the round penetrating his heart, it had bust his heart on the inside and uh, it bled out on the inside. So um, we maintained life support as much as we could. It was the position from where they shot him at. Unfortunately, you know, we, we can't save everybody, but it's always sad. Losing human life is always sad. and. Uh, I knew that there wasn't much that we could do with him. He, he was pulseless, apneic. I mean, he was already gone. And we tried to do CPR as long as we could, and uh, we accomplished that. But unfortunately, he was uh, killed on site, actually. He was killed instantly when the round uh, pierced his heart. So that's the sad thing about what we were fighting against.
it is a tough job. I do it because uh, my comrades, the, the guys that I've served with, my peers, my, my, my best friend that passed away. It's a hard job. You lose a lot of time with uh, your family doing this type of job. And they, they really have to be, uh, I say, hardened to, to accept that you're going to be gone. You can die within two to three seconds on the ground with, by IED or a sniper. And most spouses, they can't deal with that. You know, but I, I, I would do this until I can't do it anymore. So is it, are you married? I was married uh, approximately for nine years, but my, my wife, unfortunately, she couldn't take that uh, I was gone all the time and, and what, I, what, what I do. And she said it was horrible, and, you know, she would rather not worry about me than worry about me all the time if I was coming home or not. So my marriage end, ended because of what I do. Is it worth it? Every day is worth it that you save a life. Sometimes you get weary and, and uh, you want a normal life, but this is not a normal life. You will never be a normal soldier. I love human life. Human is nothing better than human life. Whether they're your, your enemy or not, life is life. You can't give life back. You can take life, but you cannot replace life. Blood and dust from people in power there. And as promised, Tyrone Jordan is with us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank it really you. Is. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking back on it now and watching it now, can you believe you, you did that job and that you just went out there every day and did that? I, I still can't believe it, you know. Uh, can't believe the guys that I served with, you know. It was like living in a dream, you know. And uh, I wouldn't change it for the world, not at all. I miss being in the military now. You know, now that I've, I've medically retired because I got hurt in, in action. So I wish I could do it all over again. Is that right? Yes, really? yes. Like I said, I, 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 I would do it until I couldn't do it anymore. So the only reason that I, I quit is because I got hurt, you know. And one of the very interesting things we saw is that you and your teammates went out there and saved whoever you needed to save. And sometimes it might be Taliban, sometimes it might be US or coalition troops. How did you reconcile that in your mind, or did it just not matter? Well, it didn't matter. My, my parents always taught me that uh, don't take something that you can't give back. You know, so whether it was Taliban or any other soldier that was in the coalition forces or any child, it's, it's heartbreaking to see you know, human life taken or, or just being destroyed and fighting for to survival. So just tell us, what are you doing now? You said you've, you've medically retired. Well, now my, my, my wife and I, Nisa, we, we stay in Germany, up in the, the countryside. So it's very peaceful. The war really took a toll on me and my body. So I'm doing my medical rehabilitation it's just a healing process for me. The, the, the nightmares, the dreams, and things of that nature I was having earlier, it really uh, kind of destroyed my wife and our marriage. And, and you know, I didn't uh, realize what I was going through until one morning I woke up in the middle of the floor and I, and I didn't know what had happened to my wife. I, I had a blackout, so I, I was going through my blackout phases where I didn't realize where I was at, where I was going, or things to that nature. And uh, I started seeking help after I ran in the room and I 
I asked my wife, is she okay? And what was going on? Because I used to sleep with knives and, and things of that nature under my pillow. I saw the pain that my wife was going through, so I just decided to seek help. You're openly talking about the impact this has had on you, and yet you say you'd do it again. You, you know, the thing about war and deployments is we were going through what we call a, a rapid tempo. The tempo was a, a fast-paced tempo, and you never got chance to really evaluate who you were, your emotional uh, being, how well you were. All, all you knew is to just help people, you know, and that gave you a sense of comfort no matter what you were going through, no matter if you, you, you had a bad day, just to be able to help someone. It was therapy for me. Some of the other people who we saw in the film, your comrades, do you still keep in touch with them? Do yes, you, I do, yeah. I do. And uh, I'm actually, I envy them because they're still doing the job and, uh, and I'm not. You know, it's, you meet friends that you never lose. And, and from all over the world, uh, working with different coalition forces, and you meet these guys, you keep in contact with them, the doctors, uh, the nurses. And now, sometimes I, I feel lost because that, that sense of uh, action and adventure for... And the camaraderie between you. Yes, all of yes, mm. yes. I actually have a, uh, one of my, my Wounded Warrior buddies, best friend rather, Derek. And we help each other through like uh, our trying times, like when, when we start having your nightmares and things like that. We go to these groups and we f sit down and we talk about the issues and we just uh, be there for one another until we get through that phase. Mm. You know, because we finally realize no matter you know, how caring your wife or your significant other is, uh, it's a part of us they will never understand about the crisis that we go through internally. Finally, people all over the world from all walks of life have seen this film, have seen what you and your comrades did. Do you want more people to see it, even the people closest to you, so that they can understand what you went through? How important, I guess, is it for, for for people to see this side of war? Well, it's a film of hope in that you, you can see how human beings suffer and how they are torn and what other people have to go through to, to help them through their crisis. You know, it's, we help each other. We help each other, and if we lose that sense of helping each other and knowing or lose this, the value of life and how precious it, it is, then we have nothing because this world won't exist without us understanding one another and being able to know that your life is just as valuable as mine's. So I live by the code, you know, do unto others as you will have them do unto you. And so every single patient that, that I've ever had my hands on, you know, you know I, I prayed, you know, I, I asked, asked God to help me through this crisis. I'm telling you, it was times that when you would look at certain patients, you didn't know where to start or to begin. They were so torn and mangled, you know, and, and I hope people will understand that Life is precious, you know, and, and we are made of one blood. And you suffer, I suffer. And I, and I felt the pain from every patient. So I could see myself or my sons or my wife, any loved one, any friend in that patient that was struggling to survive. And, and I was just trying to do my best, that's all. My, myself and my comrades. Tyrone Jordan, it's been a privilege talking to you today. Thank, Thank you. you so much.